Hi everyone, this is a Barclay Damon Live broadcast where we discuss all things L&E, labor and employment. I'm Ari, let's dig in. Hi everyone, welcome to What's Up with COVID-19 Vaccination Mandates Part 2. Today we are going to go through the nitty gritty of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA's uh, ETS vaccination mandate. Joining us today, I am so happy to introduce one of my absolute favorites, Mike Schiotti. We're, we work together a bunch and he's awesome. Uh, Mike is a partner in our Syracuse office and he has decades of experience representing employers in many facets, counseling employers um, on wage and hour issues, discrimination issues, the whole gamut. And he has tried several discrimination trials to verdict. So Mike, thanks for joining. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you. Um, Mike, one of the things that we've been doing, and I, you know, I don't, again, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you're on the spot, uh, is just asking our guests to give us a fun or interesting fact about their personal or professional life, just to kind of break the ice. And from knowing you, I'm sure you have many interesting facts about yourself <laughs> or your practice, but I'll turn it over to you just to give us, you know, a little preview. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you one that's, that's personal uh, and, and, and surprises a lot of people. I own over 50,000 comic books. What? <laughs> 50,000? You know, I did not know that about you, but we're going to have to have an offline conversation <laughs> because I'm very into all the Disney Plus Marvel shows that have come out. I don't know if you've been tuning in. Absolutely. But, don't miss any of them. Yeah. <laughs> Great. We're going to talk offline about that. Right. We won't subject our listeners to that, although maybe some of our audience would like to hear about that. Um, but anyway, Mike, thanks again. I think we should dig right into it because we have a lot to get through and this is some complex stuff. So just briefly... On November 4th, OSHA issued its Emergency Temporary Standard, or ETS, vaccination mandate. It was scheduled to go into effect November 5th. Mike, before we get into, you know, the the details, can you just tell us generally what, what this OSHA rule is? Yeah, the OSHA rule um, is currently stayed, meaning no employer has to uh, move forth with, with the regulation giving a, a, a injunction that's in place by the court. If the injunction is lifted um, and the Department of Labor has made an effort recently to, to make that motion, say lift it, uh, what will happen is the standard would go into effect. My guess is OSHA would set new deadlines for employers to comply. And employers that have over a uh, 100 or more employees um, would have to comply uh, with the standard which basically is your workforce is going to have to either be fully vaccinated uh, or you'll come up with uh, uh, an alternative, which would be a weekly testing for employees coming into uh, the workplace. Great. And we'll get into the details uh, of that for sure. But I just want to circle back to a point you made about the status of the, the mandate. So, you know, it's my understanding that right now, um, the mandate is stayed, as you mentioned, and that's the result of a Fifth Circuit decision um, staying it. And then, you know, OSHA has come out and said, you know, as a result of that case, we are not going to enforce the standards at this time. That's that's 100 percent correct. Um, and, and given the fact that there were lots of lawsuits filed all over the country against OSHA, uh, it, it wound up in what's called multi-jurisdiction litigation. And uh, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals will be making a ruling um, uh, that will have nationwide impact. Uh, after that ruling, I, I think regardless of which way it goes, uh, it's going to wind up in, in the U.S. Supreme Court. So, Mike, you mentioned that the Sixth Circuit is hearing it as hearing the the case, um, you know, and I, I think that's a result of like a multi-jurisdictional lottery, which basically happens in federal court when, as you mentioned, you know, you have a bunch of states or a bunch of different lawsuits filed. Uh, and, you know, I think what's interesting is that the Sixth, the Sixth Circuit, um, it's my understanding, you know, out of the 16 judges that are there, 11 of them are actually um, Republican appointees to the court. So I think, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see how this how this shakes out. Yeah. And, and I, I want to put too much credence in that, uh, you know, Republican or Democratic appointees. Once someone goes on the bench, they sort of get their mind of their own because it's appointed for life. 
Um, the, the one thing I, I think this is, some people think, well, it, it's about whether uh, the mandate is a good idea or not, and it's not. It's about does OSHA have the, the authority to do what it did uh, in, in, in that regard. And so it's really an authority question uh, uh, at the end of the day, but uh, we'll see how it uh, pans out and then we'll just have to wait. Yep. So you anticipated my next question, Mike, which is, you know, basically the, the basis of the challenge to the mandate. And it's really an authority issue, as you mentioned, um, whether OSHA has the, you know, authority under the emergency temporary standards regulations to make such a broad or sweeping mandate. Yeah. And, and one of the things the, uh, the court in Texas pointed out was that they took four months to develop an emergency standard. Right. And, and their response was basically couldn't have been that much of an emergency if you spent four months doing it. So uh, that's going to be a problem um, uh, for OSHA because I think that's the reality uh, of it. And then there were some comments made by President Biden uh, which um, were being used against the administration in the litigation as well. So it, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this turns out. Agreed. And, you know, to our listeners, stay tuned because, you know, hopefully we'll have an answer in the somewhat near future. But, you know, as of right now, the mandate is stayed. But notwithstanding the stay, it is important, you know, for us to talk about the requirements of the mandate because, you know, as we mentioned, they are pretty expansive. So let's dig in, Mike. If you guys listened to our first couple episodes, we warned you how quickly things can change. Subsequent to the recording of this episode, the Sixth Circuit lifted the stay on the OSHA rule, basically holding that any associated risk with the continued spread of COVID-19 outweighed any harm caused by the mandate. Subsequent to the ruling, the United States Department of Labor has issued a statement saying that employers have until January 10th of 2022 to come into compliance, but that there will be a grace period until February 9th for those employers who are using good faith, reasonable efforts to comply with the rule. Also subsequent to the ruling, an immediate appeal was filed with the United States Supreme Court and the court is scheduled to hear oral argument on January 7th. We'll be sure to keep you updated. Um, You know, you mentioned generally what the mandate is. Um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about, um, you know, who the mandate applies to on the employer side. I know you mentioned it's employers with 100 or more employees. Are there any other eligibility requirements or things like that for employers that the mandate would apply to? Yeah, a, a, a few. There, there's a few. Uh, I, I call it the Biden triangle. There were three initiatives launched by the President Biden at once. One applies to federal employees and federal contractors, the other to healthcare workers, the other to uh, private sector employers employing a 100 or more employees on November 5 or thereafter. And I'll explain yes. that. Uh, in, in, in a second. Um, so the, the requirement is that you don't fall into either the federal employee slash contractor mandate, which is also state, uh, or the CMS healthcare worker mandate, which I believe is also state uh, 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 as well uh, in this regard. I think there's an injunction that another court has issued. Yep. So that's, uh, that's uh, the, the triangle uh, um, and, and who is impacted generally. So Mike, just focusing on the, the mandate that applies to um, employers with 100 employees or more, if you're an employer, how do you count the number of employees that you have to satisfy that 100 employee requirement? Sure. Let, let's assume uh, for the first date that we use is November 5, 2021. Um, how many employees did you have uh, as of that day. A part-time employee counts as one. A full-time employee counts as one. Uh, uh, in, in that regard, there's no difference between a part-timer uh, and, and, and full-timer. And basically, I take a look at your payroll records and I figure out how many employees you had uh, uh, on that uh, uh, day. Now, let's say on November 5th, you had 90 employees um, and then you hire 10 more in January 2022, you become covered um, uh, on the day that you hit 100 employees. Um, And the last part of the test is, what if I started out at 100 employees, but then I got rid of half my workforce because I lost a big contract? You're still covered. Once you are covered by the emergency temporary standard, uh, you are covered until it is lifted 
um, uh, uh, by OSHA, and that assumes it at some point goes into effect. Right. And I think that's a really important point to make, Mike, because there really is no account for fluctuations in workforce. So, you know, obviously a lot of employers are experiencing that as a result of the pandemic. But the fact remains that if you had at some point after November 5, 100 or more employees, regardless of, as you mentioned, whether you fired half of your workforce, you're still going to be covered by the the ETS mandate, assuming that, you know, the mandate is upheld. Correct. So, Mike, you mentioned that, you know, the the mandate requires that uh, employees be vaccinated. I'm curious, what qualifies as vaccinated under the ETS mandate? Yeah, the, the good news is the booster is not part of, of, of the mandate. So you can sort of set uh, booster shots uh, 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 aside. Uh, but basically, you have to have one of the FDA, FDA authorized shots completed. So one Johnson & Johnson or two of the Pfizer or two of the uh, um, Moderna is, is what's going to qualify. There's also a, a very limited exception. There's some uh, individuals out there uh, receiving clinical trials for experimental COVID-19 yes. um, uh, shots. Uh, they would also qualify uh, in that regard. I don't know a lot about what the experimental <laughs> experimental shots are, but there there is an exception that is carved out uh, for them. So, Mike, to be vaccinated under the mandate, you have to have, if, if it's a vaccine that calls for two doses, both doses, and then is there a waiting period then after the second? Yes, yes, there is. I, I, I think it's a, a seven-day uh, look back, if memory serves correctly, what, what's in it. So you have to be fully vaccinated and, and then basically serve out the waiting period, and then you're, you, you qualify, you meet the definition of fully vaccinated. Understood. So, Mike, I know you mentioned the mandate is a, a vaccination or test out uh, mandate. So that meaning you have to you know, require that employees be vaccinated or you can have a test out option, which we'll talk about more later. But under the ETS mandate, what qualifies as a COVID test? Yeah. So um, the, the COVID test, uh, let, let's first, it's an employer choice. Are we going to require everyone to be fully vaccinated or just part of our workforce and allow a test out procedure. Um, it, it's, so it starts with what does the employer uh, want? Um, the question of, of what is a, a qualifies as, as, a, as a, a, a test. Um, you know, we have these over the counter tests that, that, that are out there now. Um, that test can be used, but the employee cannot both uh, self-administer and self-read uh, uh, the test. So the regulations point to the, you know, the, the employee can do the test in front of the employer or a telehealth provider that's authorized by the employer. And, and that's one way uh, 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 to, 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 to do the, uh, the test. Or you go to a, a, an urgent care, you go to a hospital and, and you get a test there and you know, within 24 hours, um, uh, you'll get back a little piece of paper saying, COVID, no COVID. And, right. and, and that is what you would ultimately uh, give uh, to, to your uh, employer if you went to some uh, third party. So that's, in a nutshell, that's it. That makes sense. But basically, I guess it's important for us to know for our listeners that, you know, an at-home COVID test just self-administered by an employee is really not going to cut it without that yes. extra step. Yeah, you need that. that it, 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 it can't be both it's self-administered and self-read. You need someone to, to handle uh, the, the one part of it, uh, uh, if you would. And, and you, I, I, I think my view, the best way is uh, if the employer's going to allow it, uh, have the employee administer it and then have the employer read it or have the telehealth uh, um, do it. But also, you know, was it you know, we all know what the COVID test is. Was it far enough up the nose? Did it touch the brain? You know, the yes. stuff that I, I want to know nothing about if I'm an employer and, and whether you do it or not, or you just say go to some third party is really an employer choice. Yes, that makes that makes sense. So, um, Mike, you know, let's focus on the first piece of the mandate. So let's assume that an employer decides that they are going to implement a mandatory vaccination policy. 
Uh, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about what exceptions there are provided in the mandate if an employer decides to go that route. So there is an exception um, for employees who are not able to get the vaccine under those circumstances if the employee or if the, uh, excuse me, if the vaccine is medically, I think the the word is contraindicated as per the regulations. Is that right? Yeah. And, and what that typically is, is you could be on some type of medication um, that is not a good idea to get the shot while you're on. Um, so until you're off it, uh, the physician may take the position you can't get the shot because you're on some medication and it's going to hurt you. It's going to counteract something. Um, so that's one uh, uh, of, of the big exceptions that we see. And, and um, I've heard contradicting things, but one of the uh, one of the drugs I believe it is is prednisone. Um, if you're on prednisone, I don't think you're supposed to get um, uh, the, the shot. But I've heard contrary things in that regard. But it's really a medical determination relative to what the employee's individual medical status is. Right. So in addition to, you know, whether there is a medical contraindication for the vaccine or, you know, I, I think there's also an exception, which I think you mentioned, which is, you know, if there if there's some medical reason for the vaccine to be delayed because you're on a particular medication or you have some, you know, some uh, medical condition that, a, you know, a physician determines. And that's probably an important part, important point to make, Mike. Um, this has to be something that a physician determines is medically contraindicated, right? Yeah, so it, 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 what I would put that in is, and I would classify that as a, um, a, a reasonable accommodation because of a disability yes. based on a medical uh, a condition. It's not something for the employee to wake up one morning and say, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Uh, I, I'm afraid of needles. Um, I don't know what's in the vaccine. They're tracking me or whatever else employees are, are, are going to say. It's a healthcare provider determination that you have some medical condition that is contrary to and could cause you harm if you get the, the vaccination. One of the things, actually, the only thing I've seen so far are some individuals who have um, uh, certain types of allergies. The, um, the immunization is not recommended for uh, in, in that regard. And if you get a medical notation um, and a medical uh, record of some type saying this is the deal why, you know, you, the employer has the right to question it or accept it. Um, and if they accept it, we have to come up with the alternative. But I think the OSHA has sort of laid out the alternative for us. It's the testing. Um, you know, if you're coming in the office for a test check every seven days and the only way you get in here is if you uh, hand me a piece of paper saying um, you had a test and uh, you're good for seven days. Right. So, Mike, and I, I think you anticipated my question. And, you know, we talked about this last week in the context of the CMS mandate and in the context of the New York health care vaccination law. But it is in the ETS mandate, is there an explicit exception, you know, for individuals who have sincerely held religious beliefs or, as you mentioned, um, you know, have a, a medical condition or disability which prevents the individual from receiving the vaccine yes yes to both um so the uh the first one we would look at uh, under the americans with disabilities act and the corresponding state law the human rights law um and uh, does it and the undue hardship rule also comes into play there you run it like a normal disability accommodation like we have been since 1990 um, yes. There's nothing special other than it's brand new and, and we have to deal with it. Under Title VII and the state human rights law, uh, individuals who have a sincerely held religious belief um, may be entitled uh, to a, a religious accommodation so they don't have to get the vaccine. Um, that's going to be problematic for many individuals because um, pretty much the major religions have come out uh, and, and said the vaccine does not violate their tenants, it's okay uh, uh, to get it. Um, and you also have under uh, the religious aspect, the analysis of undue hardship um, uh, and whether, uh, you know, allowing the religious accommodation causes the employer that un undue hardship. So they were all at play, but again, I think they're easily solved 
um, by the other part of, of the OSHA uh, mandates, like, okay, you don't want to take the test, um, you, you know, we're going to give you the test out uh, option, and that seems to be the key. Um, you know, one of the things we're seeing, Ari, and I sort of chuckle, is some employees are taking the position, I refuse to get tested because of a clearly held religious belief, which um, so far has not held water uh, in any analysis that I have done or others done uh, in, in the office. Uh, I, I think that's a, um, a crock, uh, to, to be frank, uh, in, in, in that regard. They just don't want to uh, get, get tested. But I, I think the key on the religious aspect is that the major religions, what I call the mainstream religions, Christianity, yes. Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, you know, sort of come out and said, this is okay. Um, and, and what we're dealing with are individuals who don't want to get the shot uh, in, in the vaccine. And they're, they, they're suddenly citing scripture. They're suddenly uh, saying they're Christian. And, and they're, they're putting this forth. Um, employers who are pushing back and push back with the right questions you know, uh, they're denying their religious exemptions because it's like you're just, you're, you're, some of them are just making it up. Some of them it's not sincerely held. Um, and, and others, uh, you know, are newly formed churches. We had recently the Church of the Anti-Vaxxers, which was recently formed. Um, and, and it's a direct response to the COVID vaccine. So there's right. so much to play here. It's amazing. And I think at least for me, Mike, and I'm, and I'm sure for you, you know, this, the religious, the sincerely held religious belief aspect of the exception is is something we're getting a lot of questions about, as you mentioned, because, you know, it's really been a real a hot button issue. Um, so to our listeners, stay tuned because next week we're going to, you know, go into a little bit more detail about, you know, what to do if you're an employer and, and an employee is refusing to get vaccinated on that basis. Um, but, you know, I think that's great, Mike. And you know, we did talk about, of course, employer eligibility and what employers are covered, you know, under the mandate. But what I wanted to talk with you about next is whether the ETS mandate applies to all employees within that workforce. Yeah, the, the answer is no. Um, it, it, it generally applies to employees coming into the office. So don't confuse here the coverage test, whether whether you're covered by the standard with whether it applies to a specific employee. The standard itself, the substance, you must be vaccinated uh, uh, or test out, applies to those employees coming into the office. So if you have a workforce of 150 employees, uh, 50 of work, of which work at home exclusively, and it's key, exclusively, yes. um, uh, they don't have to comply with this standard, but let's say you have one of those 50 employees who needs to come in for a meeting. They're gonna to have to either be fully vaxxed or test seven days before um, uh, uh, coming into uh, uh, the, the office. There's also an exception for working exclusively outdoors. Um, usually it's the construction industry uh, we're seeing, uh, again, exclusively outdoors. If they work five days a week, they're in the field five days a week. It also covers your company vehicle. Um, and uh, the, the OSHA standard surprisingly goes into excruciating detail on what is um, a completed building um, uh, in, in that regard. So if the air is not free flowing from the outside, um, that's indoor work. Uh, in, in, in that regard, highly fact specific, yes. uh, but we did get into a lot of detail. So Mike, I think that's a really important point about, you know, exclusively working from home, because I know, you know, a lot of employers and a lot of our clients, you know, have a hybrid workforce right now. Some people come into the office, some people are required to, you know, it's industry specific. Some people do work exclusively from home, but, you know, I have a question as it relates to, let's say you have a hundred and a hundred employees 50 are exclusively work from home and 50 come into the office. All of those 100, or excuse me, all of those employees count toward the 100 employee requirement, right? But with the caveat that only the 50 who do not work exclusively from home or come into the office are required to be vaccinated. Is that right? That's 100% correct. 
Right. So I think that's, you know, that's kind of an interesting point to make because there's a piece of it where these employees count toward the total, you know, number. It's very broad as it relates to counting how many employees fit, you know, satisfy the 100 employee requirement. But then when you're actually looking at each individual employee, it's not always the case that every single employee will need to be vaccinated. Correct. So and, just, and also just remember the we're seeing some employers impose more rigid standards than OSHA was even doing. That is allowed. Uh, yes, it, that's it, a it, really good better. point. Right. So basically, if um, you know, if if you're an employer and you want to implement, you know, I'll call them safer, more restrictive, you know, um, policies as it relates to this mandate, you're permitted to do that. Yeah, and, and there's uh, there's one interesting caveat uh, which, which we we haven't talked about the the, the uh, ETS standard indicate it preempts contrary state and local laws, yes. not ones that um, are in harmony with it, and not ones where they sort of exceed it. And, and when I first read it, I was a little perplexed, but then it it hit me what they were referring to. Not so much here in New York and, and, and in the Northeast, but as you start to go down into Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida, there's a bunch of laws down there that have been acted at the state and local levels that say, dear employer, you cannot force your employee to be vaccinated. Yes. That would be something that is contrary to the OSHA standard, and the OSHA standard, if it is ultimately deemed legal, um, would overrule that in that regard but it wouldn't overrule for instance if you have a fully vaxxed workforce like your entire workforce is fully vaccinated and the employer says um uh we still want you to wear a mask at all times um so that that would be something that would be not contrary uh, uh, at, at the end of the day under the standard great point mike so just circling back to, you know, what employees are covered, um, what about part-time employees? Yeah, um, if, if they are coming into uh, the, the office, they would be covered by the standard. If they're not working exclusively outdoors, they're covered by the standard. Um, and they would count towards the cover, overall coverage determination as well. Understood. And then I did want to lastly ask you, Mike, because I think, you know, a lot of employers have this type of employment relationship. Um, and I know our clients do. What about independent contractors? Independent contractors are not employees and therefore do not count um, towards the the underlying uh, are you covered by the standard or the underlying parts uh, uh, of the standard. So they, they simply are deemed um uh, not relevant. However, we all know, those of us that practice labor and employment law, uh, the government can challenge the status of an independent contractor, yes. claiming they're really an employee, and so can the uh, independent contractor. Yes. So, Mike, um, you know, before we get into just kind of what a vaccina a mandatory vaccination policy under the ETS mandate should include, I did want to ask you briefly, you know, what about our listeners who have uh, unionized workforces? Does this mandate apply, you know, to unionized workforces? And is it the same 100 employee uh, threshold? Yes, it, it, yes to both. Uh, it applies to unionized workforces and, and uh, it's the same uh, uh, threshold. The interesting thing that the ETS adds is the union and uh, employer are free to agree on additional safeguards as long as they meet or exceed the OSHA uh, uh, standard. So a unionized workforce uh, and the employer, I think, have a little more flexibility um, than the non-unionized workforces under the standard, but they still have to, uh, at the minimum, meet the standard. I, I, in, in that regard. So a little more wiggle room, but I don't think as, as much as people think. Yeah. And I think that's consistent with, you know, the, the basis of, you know, collective bargaining. So essentially what you're saying, Mike, is if you have a unionized workforce, you can provide for what they call greater protections in the collective bargaining agreement than what the ETS mandate calls for, mm -hmm. but you cannot bargain or agree to lesser protections. Correct. I think that makes sense. So, um, Mike, you know, I just wanted to talk with you as well about, you know, the content of these of the mandatory vaccination policy. 
Um, you know, and, and I would point out as well for our listeners that, you know, I think OSHA actually does provide some sample policies if you if you go to the website. Is that right? That's correct. There's two versions of the policies that are out there. One is for the employer that has a mandatory vac- vaccination policy only. And the other one is the hybrid that allows for mandatory vaccine for part and the um, uh, the test out uh, for them. I am recommending to employers if the ETS standard is uh, affirmed and, uh, eventually uh, to simply adopt one of those, depending on which one you're going to do. It is, I, I describe it as a fill in the blank, but it's pretty involved. It's going to take you hours to fill in the blanks, if, if you would, relative to your workforce. Um, very detailed. I think one of them is eight pages long and the other one is 10 pages yes. long. Yeah, I saw um, that. Yeah. And, and so there, there's a lot in those suckers. Right. So, Mike, just generally, you know, what what does the vaccination policy and I don't want to get into, you know, complete nitty gritty type details, but what are just the basic, you know, things that need to be included if you decide to go the route of the mandatory vaccination policy? Sure. You know, it, it, a lot of it is an explanation of the ETS and the standard itself um, uh, and, and what have you to sort of put the employees at ease as to why this is going on. Yes. Um, there is a going to be a component for uh, religious accommodations. There will be a component for the disability accommodations. Uh, there, OSHA has identified a series of items that you must uh, um, reference or somehow uh, direct the employee to, including CDC standards, uh, reminding an employee if they provide a fake vaccine card that that is a felony uh, yes. under 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 federal law to sort of warn employees, hey, if you do this, um, you're committing a federal felony. Um, uh, which is not a, a, a good idea. Not great. Um, a lot of it is, is your general HR stuff. Uh, you know, who do we go to? Uh, how do we uh, how do we prove we're vaccinated? What is an, um, how do we upload that proof? Things like that um, that you would typically expect to see. But if, when you look at their policies, are, are, it's basically everything that we've talked about thus far is in there in one form or another. And yep. probably everything we're going to talk about moving forward is going to be in there in one form or another. Very comprehensive. Yes. Agreed, Mike. And there is a requirement as well that the policy is distributed to every employee, correct? Co- correct. Uh, you, you know, I um, there's I, I would recommend that you get a, a, an employee sign off, either a real signature or an electronic signature. Doesn't appear to be um, re- required. I think that's just HR. Uh, 101, I would post the policy with your other employment posters and, and keep it there as, as, as well. There is no requirement that you give it to OSHA initially. Um, there are some rules that, that are in there about if OSHA asks for it, you do have to give it to them. Um, but uh, that's it, it, it. Don't overlook the general uh, HR stuff. Get the right. sign up. Uh, you know, I, I don't want an employee saying, I never got the policy. Yeah, make make them sign off. Right. That's important too, Mike, because, you know, it, it's a policy, you know, a larger policy that OSHA has, you know, mandated, but all the common sense stuff or the practical stuff that we talk about as it relates to, you know, distributing the policy, that stuff is, is all still in play. Mm-hmm. Great. So uh, I just wanted to talk just um, briefly, Mike, about a couple housekeeping type things like we mentioned in the ETS. Is there any requirement that you have to file your mandatory vaccination policy with OSHA if you're an employer? Uh, There is not. Um, There is um, initially there is not. However, if OSHA asks for um, you are required to produce it to OSHA within four business hours. And, And most employers probably would be surprised by that. But if this standard goes into effect and if OSHA calls you, faxes you, emails you, we want it, uh, you have four business hours uh, uh, to do it. And make sure you understand what that means. If they ask for it at nine in the morning, you, you have until one um, uh, to, to, to produce it in the afternoon. But if they ask for it at five o'clock and the close of the business day, uh, it's four hours the next morning um, that you'd be required to produce it. So you have to, you have to uh, give it up. 
Yeah, that's good to point out because that is a very quick turnaround time. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it in 30 years of practicing law, uh, but that it is the quickest turnaround time I have ever seen. Wow. Well, Mike, thank you so much again uh, for joining us today. I think this is a good place for us to stop. We still have a lot of material we want to go through with our listeners as it relates to the requirements of the ETS mandate. But the good news is, is next week we will pick up right where we left off and we will talk about proof of vaccination under the ETS mandate. Mike, anything to add before we sign off? Nope. Look forward to the rest of our chat. Absolutely. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. See you next week. The Labor Employment Podcast is available on BarclayDamon.com, YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Like, follow, share, and continue to listen. Thanks. This material is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice or a legal opinion, and no attorney-client relationship has been established or implied. Thanks for listening.